So let's uh, begin. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today, uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Laura De Limpio. Laura is a senior lecturer in philosophy of education at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, and Laura's title for today's talk is When Good Art is Bad, Educating the Critical Viewer. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak today in this new online uh, virtual seminar branch. And I'm just going to make sure my PowerPoint clicks forward. Why is it not clicking forward? That's, we just tested this and it was working fine. There we go. So the stimulus for this kind of talk is this idea of the quote from Oscar Wilde, which is written in the preface to the picture of Dorian Gray, where he says, there is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written, that is all. And so he's capturing this idea of a position known as aestheticism, that what we should focus on when we're looking at artworks, including literary artworks, are the artistic or the formal features, the writing of the book, these kinds of things, rather than an ethical evaluation of the artwork. And one way to start by thinking about some of the ideas I'm going to raise is to see if we can separate an aesthetic versus a moral reading of an artwork. And so I'm not going to actually ask for your answers, but one example for yourself that you can think about to start with is if you think about in particular a book or a film that maybe you've read or seen recently that had an impact on you, that it had some kind of an effect. Try and think about the artistic or the aesthetic value, the effect it had on you, what you, what you liked about it, what you enjoyed or, or didn't about it. But then try and think about the moral impact or the moral message, the moral value that perhaps you ascribed to this same artwork. I think it's often easier to do this with a narrative artwork example. And then think about the overall kind of value that this work had if you're going to try and rate it in some kind of way. And the important question here is, are these values different? Are, are they intention? Um, is the aesthetic value impacted upon in any way by the moral value or vice versa? And so if you think about you know, some of these examples, it gives rise to the kinds of questions that I'm interested in exploring in this talk. And so the key question that I'm trying to look at is, how should we teach um, young people to engage with art? It seems obvious that we want them to engage with the aesthetical qualities, the formal features of an artwork. But is it also important that they engage in some way with the moral meaning and the moral messages and the moral value of that artwork? And some of the subsidiary questions that come from this is, you know, does the moral value of the artwork have anything to do with its aesthetic value? Are they completely autonomous realms or do they impact upon one another? Um, does a good work of art also have to be moral? And then other questions, which in this talk I won't get to, but I'm interested in, have to do with what can we learn from artworks, particularly narrative artworks. When talking about art, it can be a bit complex because there are certainly three important perspectives to consider um, at least. And that's what when we're talking about, you know, there's an artist who creates the artwork, usually with some kind of intention to make something. And then there is, you know, the display or the representation that is given of the art object. And of course, the audience receives that. There's the spectatorship. But there can also be the third perspective of the, the critic or the critical review. And it's relevant to think of the art object, the artist who creates it and the person who receives it. So just to give a little bit of background of a couple of aesthetical positions in philosophical aesthetics to start with that I'm drawing upon and then considering the educational implications of these positions. So a classic position known as autonomism or aestheticism, sometimes linked to formalism, is, is the idea that um, art and ethics are autonomous or discrete realms of value. 
So this is in relation to aesthetics and ethics. Um, so variations on this theme include radical autonomism, which doesn't even want to consider any kind of moral or political or social or economic value of the artwork. They only think that the aesthetic value is what can be judged of an artwork. Um, and then moderate autonomism, which is a little bit further along that scale, says that you, know, you can make a, another kind of judgment of the artwork. You can make an ethical judgment of it, for example, a political judgment, but that doesn't affect its overall or aesthetic value. So I'm calling these positions that of the aesthete, just to, to label them in that way. In contrast to this is the ethicist position. And again, there's sort of gradients of strength of position. Uh, the moderate moralist, someone like Noel Carroll, says that well, some works are concerned with morality and in such cases, the moral evaluation is relevant to the work's overall value. Again, the overall value being considered here is usually that aesthetic value of the artwork. Ethicism is quite close, similar position, um, which is an all things considered view saying that wherever there is an ethical value of that artwork, it is relevant to the overall value of the work if it's included. If it's there, it is part of what is judged. Now, on the opposite extreme to or, uh, radical autonomism is radical moralism. And that's where the moralist says that the overall value of the artwork is its moral value. And I'm not going to be talking about that position today. So I want to consider the aesthetes position, which includes autonomism, aestheticism and moderate autonomism. And then I'm going to contrast that to the ethicist position, what I'm calling the ethicist position, which includes moderate ethicism or moderate moralism. And I'm considering the educational implications of each to make a claim as to how we want to teach young people to engage with artworks and whether or not that then has any kind of impact on which aesthetic position we should adopt. So I want to be charitable and try and consider um, the strengths and the weaknesses of both positions. And so to start with, the autonomist or the aestheticist is usually a formalist who wants to protect what's unique and conceptually distinct to artworks, which is the formal features of artworks and the fact that art objects are designed uniquely to give us an aesthetic experience, to give us aesthetic enjoyment, uh, there's the idea that they should be enjoyed for their own sake alone. So the idea of art for art's sake. And in particular, aestheticists are protecting high art from censure and from being reduced to any kind of instrumental values. So they want to look at the essential value of art being art itself for its own sake to give rise to these aesthetic experiences, which are gleaned from engaging in a disinterested objective manner with the formal artistic features of the work, which can include beauty, expression, line, texture, structure, form, unity, composition, design, these kinds of things. So the aesthete the then is going to say that any kind of instrumental value made of artwork, it's political, it's economic, it's moral value, is, is detracting from what's uniquely special about art, which is its aesthetic impact and value. And they, they are very anti that. So a lot of artists themselves would call themselves aesthetes. So, you know, you get WH Auden, George Orwell, Oscar Wilde saying that, claiming that they are aesthetes. The most radical version of this can be summed up in the Bloomsbury group. You've got Clive Bell who's saying that it doesn't even make sense to assess a work of art in terms of its morality or its politics or its impact in the world. Um, a little less radical than that is moderate autonomism, which is, well, you can make those kinds of judgments and values of art, but they're not the most important thing about art and they won't affect the overall value of the artwork. So there's some Venn diagrams to represent those two positions. Um, done by Ella Peake from her PhD thesis in Aesthetics and Ethics at UWA. And that just sums up what I've just described. So the autonomist or the aesthete is basically wanting to protect art. They want to have free expression 
for artists. They don't want art to be reduced to social, political, moral or economic or other ends. Um, they are worried about censorship and rightly so, given the history of art being censored based on certain kinds of political and moral, you know, norms and values and agendas. Um, they also, uh, in the theoretical sense, are often um, can be anti-craft and, and design in the sense of, you know, um, they would consider craft as less than high art because it has, has a use value. So um, something like pottery, for instance, which, you know, it's obviously artists are making these pots, but if they're designed to be used, then they're not just art for art's own sake alone, some of the formalists would, would argue. And in some senses, we can see why they would be worried in this way, particularly if we think about making moral um, meaning from artworks where it seems as if the aesthetic value is actually secondary to the moral value. So um, something like Aesop's Fables, where the aim there is to get a moral message, sort of maybe not very subtly shoved down someone's throat or to reinforce a certain kind of moral norm. Um, it's not art for art's own sake, it's art for the sake of being a vehicle for some other means. So the case against asceticism, the position of the ethicist, which I will actually be defending, uh, starts with this, I'm going to you know, make this controversial claim that despite his explicit claims, Oscar Wilde isn't really an aesthete at all because the moral messages and impact of his work are so central to his work. And you can't engage with his work without engaging with those moral messages. So while he's known for taking this position that there's no such thing as a good or bad book, rather books are well or badly written, you can't ignore the ethical messages that are imbued in his novels, in his plays. Um, and these are so central that if you're going to understand the work at all, you must engage with these ethical messages. Not only that, that they augment the overall impact and value of the artwork itself. It's the moral message of Dorian Gray that largely contributes to making it such an impactful work. And Wilde knew this to be the case. So he's actually trying to protect himself um, by taking this position as an aesthete. So the case against uh, aestheticism is that if it is an intrinsic part of the work, should the moral message, I'll focus on the moral message and not worry about too much about other kinds of messages at the moment, but should that then necessarily count towards the overall value? And it can either augment or diminish. It can count in positive or negative ways towards the overall aesthetic value of the artwork. So in terms of my educational interests here, I'm thinking, well, this matters in terms of how we teach students to engage with art, how we're thinking about them engaging with art. If we take up the position of the aestheticist, some really strong points here. You know, we're gonna value art for its own sake you know, not that it's being used instrumentally in society. There is a protected space for the free expression of artists and artworks that we're able to be open and receptive to. We're anti-censorship on this position. You've got Posner arguing that actually the moral properties of artworks are basically a distraction, that even if they are there, we should be focusing on the formal or the aesthetic features of the artwork and Posner goes on to argue that, you know, against people like Martha Nussbaum and Iris Murdoch, that we don't get better from engaging with good works of literature. Uh, he says, you know, you can all imagine um, a literature loving Nazi, for example. So it's just simply not the case that there's moral improvement as a result of engaging with good works of art. Uh, the aestheticist also is trying to look at the artwork in and of itself which means that they're usually ignoring authorial intention, context, you know, these kinds of things. They're judging on its own merits. Now, if we adopt the position of the ethicist, which is what I'll be defending, then the ethical features of art are things that we should be engaging with, we should be considering, um, critiquing. In some works of art, those ethical features, I'm going to argue, are integral to its meaning, to understand the work and appreciate it, and to get the required aesthetic response from that artwork, we'll need to be engaging with the ethical features of the work, particularly with narrative artworks. And we can go on in order to defend that kind of position by seeing as 
Iris Murdoch and Mother Northbound say, um, and Wayne Booth says that language is a moral medium. It's impossible to extract and, and divorce values from how we um, describe and speak and question and frame things. We're offering some um, ethical elements when we're using words. Um, Devereaux, which we'll go on to talk about a bit more, uh, talks about how ethical judgment actually requires aesthetic sensibility. So you might have guessed here I'm, you know, sort of referencing implicitly a virtue ethics framework where we're thinking about the context and the way people respond to situations to other characters, again, using the example of narrative artwork in particular, where ethical judgment requires an all things weighing up considered view. And although I won't have time to defend it, I'm, I'm wondering if the, the reverse is true as well, then aesthetic sensibility, especially with narrative artworks, requires this ethical judgment to be able to properly perceive and engage with the text as well. So of course you can consider context and authorial intention. So the two positions that allow for that kind of position are ethicism and moderate moralism. And there's a couple of Venn diagrams to depict what they look like, where if I'm engaging with the artwork in an all things considered uh, manner, I'm not just engaging with the formal features, the aesthetic features, I'm thinking about the impact like entertainment value, it's realism, it's sensitivity, that's going to include some judgments about ethical or moral value as well. I'm using the words ethical and moral interchangeably for the purposes of this talk. Okay, so returning back to your example, thinking again, you know, can we make a moral judgment about an artwork um, or can we just leave that out? Can we evaluate just the book on the quality of its writing alone? Um, why would the aesthete and the ethicist value an artwork differently? Um, are those values going to come into conflict or are they reconcilable? And for example, can a book actually be very good aesthetically, well written and valuable, but immoral? So in arguing against the position of the aesthete, we often see these quite rare examples of where the aesthetic and the moral value are in tension, but particularly where it's a very good aesthetically pleasing work of art with an immoral message. The classic example that's been discussed in the literature is Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. So Triumph of the Will is depicted as a documentary, but it's an infamous propaganda film of the 1934 Nazi party rally in Nuremberg in Germany. Leni Riefenstahl was commissioned by Hitler himself to make the film and had unprecedented control over the creation of this artwork. So there's a lot of research that suggests she was very sympathetic to him and the cause. She always denied that. In the film, we see very distinctive artistic choices made. The opening credits see the plane descend from the sky through the clouds and then when it lands Hitler emerges as if a god descending from the heavens. While it's meant to be a documentary it's not always in perfect linear time sequence and there are certain stylistic choices that show how the message is augmented and made you know absolutely beautifully shot, the cinematography, the lighting, um, the music is by Wagner, it's very rousing, you see these, you know, joyous children's faces and, and these flags waving interspersed with cuts of, you know, the speeches given by members of the, of the Nazi party. Um, so there are definite deliberate choices made by the director, by Lenny Riefenstahl, to present the story in a particular way. So it's widely thought to be aesthetically beautiful, but morally evil. So how do we judge it? So for the aestheticist or for the aesthete, they'd say Triumph of the Will is a good example of a good work of art being used in a bad way. The overall judgment is going to be positive because it's based on the aesthetic features or the formal features alone. We're thinking about the cinematography, the music, the editing, the lighting. It's done beautifully. For the ethicist, though, we have a bit of a dilemma. 
either I'm going to be swept up in the beauty and the power of Hitler and the Nazi party because I am attending simply to the formal features of the work alone and not engaging with the ethical and political messages, or I'm actually interrupted from just being swept up in this beautiful image that's depicted and I'm unable to adopt this prescribed audience response precisely because of the unethical message that is imbued in the film. If I can't set that to the side, then it's interrupting my ability to just have this lovely aesthetic experience that I'm, that I'm being positioned to have. So the question is, you know, how do we want to educate children to engage with these kinds of works? Um, and if we're developing these kind of receptive, ideally sensitive viewers to appreciate art, can they switch off and ignore the moral messages in the artwork? Or will that necessarily interrupt and interfere with their aesthetic experience and appreciation? So by ideally sensitive here, um, again, I just mean not someone who's overly sensitive and looking to be offended or to be worried and not someone who's, you know, sort of blunt and, and um, numb to these kinds of messages. So they're meant to be someone who's generally the ideal audience member for the artwork. They understand um, that they're watching a movie or reading a book or they're able to engage with the conventions in a way so they can understand and appreciate the work um, without you know, again, using the, the golden mean, not too much, not too little. So Mary Devereaux argues in opposition to the aesthete or in opposition to the autonomist, that the ethical blemish in a work of art affects the artwork as a whole, impacting on its overall or aesthetic value. As an ethicist, she's taking an all things considered approach. And she's going to say that the ethical failing will always be an aesthetic defect as well. So you cannot have these aesthetic and moral realms of value as autonomous. They impact on each other. And we're going to take it a step further. And they say sometimes the ethical flaw will actually be a formal flaw as well. She uses triumph of the will as her main example here and says that the aesthetic value is undermined precisely because it's trying to portray Hitler as a moral political leader, all round nice guy who simply wants the best for all Germans. Now, again, you know, pausing for a minute, we've also got to consider that, you know, we're thinking about the film when it's created in 1935, if you're an audience member then, and it's a piece of propaganda that's done very, very well. Does that make any difference to the fact that if we're watching this now, we have the benefit of history of hindsight, knowing everything that happened as well? So as a piece of propaganda disguised as a documentary, the moral message of the film interrupts the aesthetic appreciation of the work. We can explain this perfectly well on ethicism. On the position of ethicism, we can explain why we fail to take up the prescribed audience response, whereas the aesthete does not say that. They say, they say you can have the beautiful aesthetic experience of the work of art, but you've somehow bracketed off the ethical experience. And I'm going to argue along with Devereaux and Noel Carroll that sometimes the ethical flaw can't be bracketed off. It's going to be an essential element of the artwork and engaging with the artwork means engaging with this ethical component. And as educators, we should be encouraging our students to engage with the ethical features of the artwork where they present and being able to critically discuss them while also being open and receptive to the artwork itself. So for example, just um, to give a different kind of example to the Triumph of the Will case, Noel Carroll says, imagine a novel that sort of unironically asks you to sympathise with an immoral character, but to really sympathise with them and to really sort of take their side. The immoral nature of the character is obvious in their actions and words, and there's sort of no redemption in it. It's not like there's some kind of overarching narrative or, you know, narrator or moral message at the end that says, oh, but, you know, they, we understand that they're immoral or that they've learnt their lesson. The problem here is if we're being given a prescribed positioning of being sympathetic to the character, but we can't sympathise with the character because they're so immoral, then that positioning is a formal flaw, not just an ethical flaw in the work. 
because the novel has prescribed an unwarranted cognitive affective response, this, and we can't take up the position of sympathy because we're objecting ethically to the, to the character themselves. In this kind of a case, and obviously it's just a sort of rough case that I've drawn a picture of here, or Carol's drawn a picture of, the moral defect is also an aesthetic defect. And if I'm judging the overall artwork and its aesthetic features, then that moral component is necessarily a part of it. So philosophers like Iris Murdoch and Martha Nussbaum don't find this uh, like don't find this um, a problem. So according to them, they think that the good artist and as well as the ideal reader, most of the examples they give are of narrative artworks, um, engage with an ethical perspective on the world. So they, they actually got a similarity between sort of engaging with the world ethically and aesthetically here. Arguably Murdoch and Nussbaum offer, you know, sort of quite an extreme position because they say that the artist has to be, you know, kind of ethically good as well as aesthetically good. They think these two go together. And of course, they're gonna say that we can learn ethically by engaging with good aesthetically and ethically artworks. Um, and that debate I'll have to set aside for the purposes of, of the talk for now because I won't have time to sort of go into it and defend it. But what, what they're saying is the things that they have in common. And again, you know, this idea of aesthetic sensibility, including some kind of ethical sensitivity, uh, is this tolerance for engaging with different points of view, imaginatively engaging with those perspectives, trying to take the position of another, which art allows us to do. Again, you can see that sort of influence there of, of virtue ethics, of, of seeing how people react and respond to their environments, to other people, you know, over time. So Murdoch says that Oscar Wilde is an imaginative writer who is also a social critic. His effective criticisms of society are made through his realistic characters in his novels. So in this sense, Wilde can't just be an aesthete. There's got to be some element of the ethical criticism that's involved in the work that he's producing. And Murdoch says, that judgments about value are unavoidable in narrative works. One cannot avoid value judgments. Values show and show clearly in literature. Again, another quote from Murdoch, language itself is a moral medium. Almost all uses of language convey value. This is one reason why we are almost always morally active. So the novelist is revealing his values by any sort of writing which he may do. He is particularly bound to make moral judgments insofar as his subject matter is the behaviour of human beings. And one thing that's important, I think, when painting the picture of this ethicist position or the person in favour of ethical criticism is that we're not talking about this kind of black and white moralistic judgments where we're just saying, oh, no, that's good, bad, and it's, and it's that crass. It is subtle. It is complex. It's not that it's easy to work out. Um, there's this subtlety involved in this kind of position. Now, as I said before, I think, you know, M Martha Nussbaum and Iris Murdoch, who hold this kind of a position, um, there's, there's a lot going for it, but they certainly hold the artist on this pedestal where they're saying that um, the, the good artwork that is aesthetically and ethically good is created by the good person, who also obviously has the skills to create this artwork, and then they say that their duty, the artist's duty, is to truth telling in his own medium. And this is setting the bar, you know, very high indeed. And, you know, Nussbaum goes on to say that, you know, even just by reading this good work of art, we can be engaged in a moral activity if we're adopting this ethical attitude, which is being open and receptive to the work itself. But I think that there is some danger here. Um, Certainly in the fact that, you know, what about, you know, messages that aren't so positive? What about even just when we're talking about sort of more unthinking and, you know, mass produced artworks, uh, media, these kinds of things. And if there are aesthetic or formal flaws in the artwork that are also ethical flaws, 
one of the things that the East Lead was worried about was this idea of censorship and blame. Certainly Wilde was worried about being blamed for what he was presenting in his works. And rightly so, you know. So this question of then, if we're going to praise the artist for what they've created, does that mean we also blame them if they create something that we don't like or we think that's immoral? Who's responsible? Should we be holding artists accountable aesthetically, ethically and politically for their work? Um, or can we instead focus or also um, on the receiver of the artwork? And so then again, you're thinking about the audience, the ideal audience member, who's the intended and unintended um, audience members for these works. Can we avoid censorship and instead cultivate open, receptive, ideally sensitive, critical audience members? So in terms of education, I'm interested in the latter. I'm interested in that we can, you know, cultivate these kinds of students who are going to be able to be open and receptive to art, to engaging with art, but that doesn't mean they're switching off their critical faculties. I'm not saying there's absolutely no place for censorship. And I certainly think that in terms of art curriculum, that educators have to think carefully of what they include, particularly when we think about how many voices have been excluded from art curriculum over time and in art galleries, those kinds of things. So I think we want to aim for something that's inclusive, but we don't want to make it so narrow that, you know, our students aren't then prepared to be able to engage in this well-rounded way when they go out into the world on their own and they're stumbling across all these different kinds of artworks, including controversial art, um, which is just so readily accessible, particularly online these days. So the moral quicksand is if we're worrying about censorship and the immoral views of artists and artworks, there's a lot of difficult examples that crop, crop up immediately. So, you know, think about classic works that, you know, are anti-Semitic or misogynistic. Um, you know, Wagner's Ring Cycle, um, the works of Australian artist Donald Friend, whose line drawing is on the side of this PowerPoint that you can see here, um, celebrated in, in while he was alive. He painted lots of pictures of, of young Balinese boys, but his diaries were published um, just after his death and caused this kind of outcry because, you know, he was a well-known pedophile. And how are these kinds of cases uh, where we have a, a moral judgment of, say, the artist, but also in the particular examples of, say, the works of Donald Friend, you can see it, it's imbued in the artwork itself. It's, it's hard to avoid that, that meaning in the artwork itself when you're engaging with it. How is that different from artworks that were just banned because they were considered, say, lewd at the time when there was a sort of conservative, you know, moral, uh, social approach at the time. But, you know, looking back, we wouldn't think of it as anything wrong. So classic example, um, Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover, which was banned for 30 years. Um, then as soon as it was granted publication rights, became a bestseller. So some of those questions I have to set to the side for now. Maybe they'll come up with people have some ideas in the question time. Um, but in my book, one of the things um, I'm really focused on is as educators, how can we cultivate the kinds of critical thinking dispositions and compassionate engagement in our students so that they can engage in an open receptive way with what they're receiving with artworks and I extend that and think about media as well, social media and mass art. But so they aren't switching off their critical uh, faculties. So I defend a position called critical perspectivism, which says that educationally, what we want to cultivate are receptive, critically engaged art appreciators, where the ideally sensitive audience member is both critical and compassionate. They're open and receptive to what they're receiving with the artwork, but they're not switching off their cognitive and their critical faculties. And that's appropriate because artworks invite responses that are both cognitive and emotional. And some of them stay with us for a long time afterwards and we continue to think about them. So artworks may invite sympathy and compassion towards characters and the scenarios depicted 
And just like the moral agent in real life is, you know, engaging with this complex and subtle and nuanced picture of how the world actually is, it should be similar to when we're engaging with art. We shouldn't be switching off the, you know, sort of the ethical judgment of the artwork. Um, and so understanding and critiquing these artworks, you know, particularly narrative artworks, involves engaging with both the aesthetic formal features as well as the ethical features if those are included in the artwork. And there might be some artworks where they're not included, but where they are present, I, I believe we should adopt this all things considered perspective and weigh them up and judge them, you know, in an open, receptive, um, charitable way, as we should a moral agent in real life, with a view of these aesthetic features that an ethical feature might be a part of one of those formal features of the artwork. So in that, I'm defending the position of the ethicist. I'm arguing in favour of ethical crit criticism of artworks. And my defence linked to an educational response ties into this idea that if we're cultivating young students to love art and engage with art and certainly understand and appreciate the formal features of artworks, we should also be encouraging them to engage critically and compassionately with the ethical messages, social political contexts within which these artworks are displayed, received. Um, and I don't think that they can do this just automatically. I don't think that they um, can, can just be told to be critical and compassionate and off they go, they do it. I think that there needs to be spaces where they can practice such engagement. And certainly, you know, art galleries do a great job of, you know, offering spaces to, for students to engage with artworks. And I think that in the classroom, educators can also, um, you know, encourage these kinds of spaces for um, a safe discussion, uh, especially of artworks that they might be engaging with anyway. So it might be, you know, the popular art, the, the songs that they love, the, the TV shows they're listening to, movies, these kinds of things. But then hopefully we can guide them to engage with you know, the canon, with other works as well. So in this way, then, um, I think we can find space to facilitate students' sympathetic and critical engagement with you know, fictional characters and scenarios as well, the narrative artworks that are already on the curriculum, but I want us to go beyond that. Um, critical thinkers, I believe, do need to evaluate their world rationally and morally. Uh, you know, they've got to be willing to adopt these different perspectives in order to learn more, feel more, see more. And art can enhance this vision. Art has a great place to play um, in helping uh, this cultivate this ethical vision as well as this aesthetic vision. So I'll leave it there and see if you've got some questions and thoughts and comments. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Laura. That's fantastic. Uh, lots of uh, discussion uh, happening uh, alongside the talk, which was uh, very, very uh, stimulating and um, well, lo lots of examples people were offering as well in the, in the chat, which is uh, which I'm tempted to dive into. But but there are a few uh, questions that are more pointed um, or more uh, opening up. Um, so maybe if we can start with um, Andres, who who had a question. So Andres, um, are you able uh, to ask your question? Well, uh, well, exactly. I don't know which question you referred to because I actually posted two of them. Uh, the first one was very early in the talk, so uh, I think that it, it was already answered. Uh, my question was specifically in which way uh, Laura was referring to moral value of a work and evaluating the moral value of a work because there is a number of ways in which one can evaluate the moral value of a work of art. But I, I, as from the talk, I, I gather that uh, she refers to evaluating the moral message that a work of art conveys. That's what I got from, from the talk, mostly. And that led me to my second question, which was at the end of the chat, uh, which is whether perhaps uh, to talk about the moral message might be something to 
um, too narrow to talk about uh, the importance of or the value, the moral value of a work of art, because there are great, very many great works of art which do not seem to convey a specific uh, moral message. They do not seem to send the moral message, uh, but nevertheless, they, they engage us critically into reflecting about the, well, the, the moral complexities of a situation and so on. Uh, so I, I was perhaps just wondering that um, whether a moral message might be a too narrow way to refer to the moral value. Thanks for your question. Yes. So in the sense that if you're happier to use the word ethical and that denotes a wider sense of value, then I'm happy to use that word. I was using the word moral and ethical interchangeably there. And the way that I'm understanding that moral value or the, the ethical impact of artworks is quite wide. And so it's following in the conversation that happens with Martin Nussbaum, Iris Murdoch, and they're argued against by Richard Posner. And so what, you know, Nussbaum and Murdoch are saying uh, isn't just about sort of, you know, a, you know, categorical imperative universal moral rule that, you know, is, is the message that comes out of an artwork, but it's the complexity of a, of a character and seeing how they respond to a situation. And so, I, again, yes, I'm, I think I'm agreeing with you that, there's an interest there in, in how the artwork invites you to think about those things, either by portraying it itself, but then I think there's also room, although, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's then a judgment necessarily of the artwork or the artist's intention, but of how that artwork impacts in the world. Um, people's reception and uptake and their reaction to art, I think is also really important to have those nuance considered ethical conversations about um, how we respond to artworks. But again, you know, I'm not wanting to go down the, the moralist line where suddenly it's like, oh, if we deem that to be bad and therefore we're going to censor it, we're going to, you know, take it off the walls of the art galleries, these kinds of things. That's, that's not where I want to get to. But I think that it's important that we talk about how, you know, at different times people respond to artworks differently or if you're a certain audience member. So uh, I was involved in a conversation where uh, a, a Jewish uh, art person was saying that, you know, that they don't think that you should stop playing Wagner. Wagner should be performed as, you know, wonderful music. But then when asked, but would you go and listen to it? They're saying, no, I, I wouldn't go and listen to it, but I don't want to stop the work playing. And so there's this, almost this internal, you know, tussle where, uh, you know, they're this person was actually adopting the position of the East Seat but then sort of separating off their own personal response to the artwork. And I think that, you know, there's no easy answers to these kinds of things, but I think that they're really important conversations and dialogues to keep having. Great. Um, there's, there's quite a few uh, questions and comments um, coming through. Um, maybe I can, uh, I can first of all ask Kai uh, to, to ask, I think he had a couple of comments, one, one of which was a question about this, the artificiality of the opposition between the ethicist and the aesthete. Um, but also he was um, uh, raising, as many people were, uh, different examples about the, uh, immor the immoral character and the sort of morally dubious nature of so many characters that, that we see. So maybe Kai, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Did, did, did you get enough to be able to formulate or reformulate a question? Kai Bortman. Okay, um, so my impression was that um, the division in the beginning might be somewhat maybe a bit artificial. Is there really uh, like a purely aesthetic or purely ethicist way of teaching an artwork and uh, then uh, combining them uh, might be simply the, the, the most obvious thing uh, you can do. I mean, just, just one, one impression, sorry. Thanks, Kai. So the positions that I started with are positions in aesthetics and ethics where they're talking about making value judgments of artworks and it's well rehearsed in philosophical aesthetics literature. Um, and my attempt 
was to bring that into dialogue with philosophy of education, uh, with educational concerns and with art education. And so I was thinking through when these positions um, are very well established, what are the educational implications of them? And I was thinking that the educational uh, impact um, or the consequence of adopting the ethicist position might offer another response to the aestheticist. Now, that might be me, me taking it too far. Um, I don't know if it can, can go that way, but it seems to me that if we take this idea of the aesthetic flaw, uh, sorry, the ethical flaw in the work can actually be an aesthetic flaw as well, then if we're engaging with the artwork as you know, teachers and as students, then we want that to be engaged with in order to engage properly and appropriately in, um, in a nuanced way with the actual artwork, then doesn't that argue against the aestheticist position, which says that these are autonomous. And so it's saying we just can't separate them uh, as much as they would like. Um, and I had a more radical thesis as well, which I've presented to artists and to philosophers before. They don't like it at all, where I actually try and say that aestheticism itself is actually an ethical position because of how they're defending artwork. But um, yeah, that hasn't gone off the ground yet. So <laughs> I'll have to keep working on that one. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, like I said, there's lots of questions, lots of uh, conversations, and it's quite hard to keep up with them all. But uh, uh, Danielle, can I come to you? You had uh, a question, Danielle, or you gave an example of Lolita uh, about the, the immoral piece, but you also added some questions at the end. Would you like to ask your questions? Yeah, of course. I, I guess I got thinking about Lolita because, of course, of course. you know, the kind of action <laughs> does in that book are very immoral and there would normally be abhorrent but the book almost manages to evoke a kind of sympathy for the protagonist and I know that's changed a lot over the last 65 years as um, was it Bob pointed out um, but I don't know in some ways I guess it hasn't as well because the film adaptation still tries to evoke that sympathy and portray it in such an artistic and aesthetically pleasing way um, and I guess my question was, do you think the aesthetic value of something can sometimes overpower our moral compass, if just momentarily? Um, and is this something that we'd maybe need to make students aware of in an educational setting? Yeah, it's a really yeah, interesting example. And it's, it's a tricky one because when I when I'm thinking about educating, I often think about educating older students and 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 at university level at adults. So I, I would I'd have to think much more carefully about you know the age or how old the, the students are who are engaging with them. I think the teachers need to make those considered judgments about what's age appropriate. Um, but I think that yes, the aesthetics of things can absolutely sweep us up and then if there's something that's you know morally problematic personally i find that we, we reflect on that or it comes back to us later um, because we're just so involved in the feeling and the experience which is exactly why historically people know that art is dangerous it's because it's impactful it's because it takes us on a journey and offers us a different way of thinking about things or seeing things and and i think that that's so important but of course there's that question of, well, what else is it saying is uh, acceptable? And with, you know, things like Lolita and even, you know, like a much more contemporary example of American beauty, the aesthetic is first. It's definitely uh, from a certain perspective that the story is told and the, the imagery, you, and you almost lose um, track of which is the fantasy and which is, you know, what's actually happening in reality. Um, and in part, I think that, you know, sometimes art is just showing us different things that are possible and are, that are imaginatively possible. And it's important to remember that, you know, just because, you know, something is depicted fictionally doesn't mean that we're engaging with the real thing either. So, you know, when we're talking about the real thing, you know, notions of consent and, and age are going to be absolutely important and relevant. So 
I, I can't actually give like just a, a single answer because I think it depends on the work. It depends on who the audience are, who's watching it, who's receiving it. I think that those things matter. And so it has to be when we're considering the particular artwork or who's watching it um, and how, how is it going to you know, impact on them. But I think that because art is so impactful, that's why it's so important to have spaces where we can have conversations about it afterwards. Uh, no matter what age we are, I think. Um, so I don't know if that actually even answers your question, really. But a couple of contemporary examples. Again, just so you know, I haven't seen any of the chat because I didn't want to distract myself. So I haven't seen any of the comments. But um, a couple of contemporary examples that have come up are things like uh, normal people, sex education, and the sort of sensitive and nuanced ways that they're offering um, insight into you know, these kinds of relationships and, and questions for younger audiences. And they, of course, will also have the backlash and the people responding saying, well, you know, is it okay for young people to be seeing these kinds of things? So I think those conversations are natural. And for me, it's more important that we're able to have them, you know, have the dialogues and have the conversation about, about them in respectful ways. Well, um, Laura, if you're short, short of, uh, of, of examples, uh, the, the chat indeed has plenty of anti-heroes from Macbeth to Lolita to Walter White and beyond. So there's uh, uh, lots of discussion about the, uh, <clears throat> about the moral ambivalence, I suppose, of, of, of these heroes and anti-heroes. But maybe uh, I can invite Martin Goff next uh, to ask, um, ask a question. Uh, Martin, are you there? Hello, hello there. Yes, uh, thanks, thanks, Laura. Very thought-provoking talk you gave, and I don't want to actually um, uh, sort of challenge the, the you know that your drift where, where you're trying to end up at all. But I, I've got a problem with with sort of the nature of the aesthetic, you know, what, what it is. And then the first question I would ask, um, and maybe this is a, um, a teaching point as well, um, is what's the meaning of this? Um, and uh, that will then go on to you know what's its value as well, but. Mean, you know, what's the meaning of, of it comes first, and um, and, and so you, you portray the um, the aesthetes as um, saying there's what works of art has have is um, some aesthetic properties of some sort, um, uh, formal features and so on. Uh, Clive Bell's significant form in one example, um, and well, the, there's a problem with the the, the, the formal bit. You know, what's formal, what isn't, and that's that was Bell's problem. But he, even if you bypass that, then the, the idea of these aesthetic qualities of having, having robust independent existence is, uh, is questionable. And um, the connection with art itself, if, if, we, if we make aesthetic judgments, then is it, um, uh, are such judgments essentially linked to something being art, or is it that we just make these sorts of judgments about anything, such as a beautiful sunset, um, that's a sort of aesthetic experience of some sort. Um, is it a bit of a sidetrack when discussing art to concentrate on the aesthetic? Is that a comment or was there a question there? Because there's lots of interesting <laughs> points you've made. I just wasn't sure if that yeah. was a question. It's a sort of multiple question, I guess. Yes. Um, uh, uh, discussing art is, is um, using the language of the aesthetic. Is that a distraction, really, from, from getting to the point of what art is? Um, I guess it depends maybe on your definition of art. So aesthetic, the, the meaning of aesthetic is just the philosophy of art. So, you know, if we think about aesthetic theory, but then if we're talking about the aesthetics of, uh, you know, the real world and the sunsets, the, the theorist you're working with will offer a different narrow or wider conception of what you include and what you exclude in that. So someone like John Dewey would say, art is an experience that you can get from anything and from the natural world. And, you know, so then we, we have a very broad concept that we're working with and some of it might not have meaning. There's not a meaning of a sunset. Um, it might have an aesthetic experience that it brings for me and I might make meaning of it. So we get more of a subjective or experiential focus there. Whereas someone like Clive Bell from the Bloomsbury Group, as you're saying, is wanting to narrow down the category of artworks in particular to things that are high art that could be displayed in art galleries that would have certain 
formal features, you rightly point out a couple of the problems with that theoretical position. One being that actually there's no uniform agreement on what those formal features are in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions, what is included, what's excluded. They can't agree. And then you've also got the problem of circularity where you're saying, well, if it has those features, it's an artwork and that's what defines the artwork. So theoretically, there are problems with each one of the positions. And, you know, I think in, if you're going back to the educators point of view, what I've seen is that, you know, particularly if you're looking at art education, which is quite a young field, really, if you're looking at the theory of it, um, a lot of them like education in general have been influenced by Dewey. And so they're, you know, generally saying, you know, what's the experience that we're getting um, and how can we express ourselves creatively through our media, these kinds of things. So then meaning making is, as you say, at the forefront, um, which of course is going to be subjective. And while I have a lot of time for that kind of position, I want to narrow it down just a little bit more than that because I think that some meanings you can make can be just wrong. So if I look at a picture of, you know, a house that's a painting and I say, well, what I see from this is that, you know, we, we, can, in, we can invade space and take over a hostile alien planet and that's the meaning I get from this artwork and you can't tell me I'm wrong. I'm, I'm just wrong. I, I've, I've, I haven't got that from engaging with that artwork. So there has to be some criteria by which we judge art, even if that's very difficult to pin down. And so, you know, obviously that is a you know, huge uh, realm of, you know, different kind of conversation that <laughs> I haven't touched on yet. Um, but where there is the ethical component to the artwork, I think that the meaning we're making involves understanding that and it involves engaging with it in this open receptive manner. So we're sympathetic to it. But my point was that we need to also be critical. So if we want to say that, you know, Lini Reefen style is actually saying to us, you know, just engage with the formal features of the, you know, triumph of the will, um, the documentary film and, and just enjoy it. Well, that's inauthentic. There's a strong moral and political message there that is part of the essential feature of the work if we engage with the work and understand it, we're engaging with that element of it. And so as educators then, yes, there's the meaning we make from it, but it has to be informed. Like that's separate to me just walking down the street and suddenly being blown away by the beauty of a flower. That's fine, that's lovely, great, but that's different to what I wanna do in the classroom where I'm wanting there to be knowledge and skills that we're also bringing to bear in the task of making meaning of artworks in a way that, you know, can be shared, can be spoken to with others who see what we see, um, informed by expertise. So I don't know if that actually answers your question. There's lots there, as you said, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, again, there's, there's lots of more questions coming through. I don't know the, uh, the if I can try and stitch these together, it's going to be tricky. So I'm, First of all, we're going to just ask Alison Brady to, uh, to ask her question next, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I guess one of the, the issues I guess I have is that when we're talking about uh, ethics here, we seem to be talking about uh, this kind of explicit, predefined kind of values that we then apply to, to an artwork. Um, and so the assumption is that, well, first of all, that values work in that way, which I don't think they do. I think a lot of uh, values come to come to be through kind of more implicit ways. Um, so it's not it's not the case that we can look at an art piece and say, you know, very explicitly that this is the moral message that the author intended us to to uh, receive, for example. Um, but also, I think that with some artworks, even though there are explicit moral um, messages, that if we just focus on those, that we actually lose quite a lot of what the author wanted us to talk about. Um, so one of the examples I thought of was, I don't know if you've ever read it, probably no one has read it. <laughs> it's called uh, so Sartre's novel, The Age of Reason. And 
on the surface, that, that book is about a man who's trying to procure an abortion for his lover. Um, and so obviously there is an explicit moral message about this and there's lots of discussion that we can have around that. But actually that sort of moral dilemma doesn't take center stage in the novel. There's all sorts of other discussions around kind of the complexities of human relationships. And the purpose is not really uh, to, to, I guess, give this very explicit moral message that what he's doing is wrong, is to get us to reflect uh, sort of in a more implicit sense on uh, the sort of contradictions that we demonstrate in our own reasoning and in our own lives. Um, and I think when we have discussions as readers on, on uh, artworks or as viewers of artworks, a lot of this, uh, you know, making certain moral messages explicit is actually the audience doing that. It's not necessarily the, the reader, right? So, or it's not, sorry, it's not necessarily the author, I should say. Um, so we, we talked about Lolita, for example, and I'm not really sure if the fact that we uh, get have sympathy for this main character you know is that the fault of the author who is arousing the sympathy within us or is that actually the fault of the reader who is feeling sympathetic towards somebody that is you know that otherwise we would think of as reprehensible so there is a sense in which uh, making messages explicit or making values explicit is actually something that the reader does as opposed to what the author does um, and so, yeah, so I, I guess my question is, I mean, are we, are, are you talking about kind of just explicit values or like explicit moral frameworks and analyzing art pieces in terms of that? Or are you talking about something more implicit? And if you're talking about something more implicit, whose responsibility is it for interpreting that? Is that the reader's responsibility? Is that the author's responsibility? Um, what, what about authors who try not to give kind of explicit messages, but maybe do give implicit messages without realizing it. I mean, are they also responsible in that sense? Um, so yeah, sorry, there's a lot of <laughs> different things. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is I actually totally agree with you. And I was hoping that I was trying to convey that. I think that if we're just talking about moralism and moralistic readings of artworks, we're doing it wrong. That it's it's too crass. And the example I gave of Aesop's fables, where actually using the artwork just as a vehicle for some kind of moral message, and what's primary is the moral or ethical message, and the aesthetic value is secondary, that's where the moral value can detract from the overall aesthetic value. So the whole beauty of engaging with the subtlety of an artwork is precisely as you say there's a lot going on and the ethical message or component shouldn't be at the forefront i'm saying there should be space to engage with it and if it's there that um, it's part of understanding the work is engaging with it as well but it's not that i'm trying to say we need to augment its position or um, sort of give it more space in the overall aesthetic value. I just want it to have its space where it's present. And I accept that some artworks won't have um, an ethical um, feature or uh, reading of it at all. And so um, it's, it's definitely meant to be a subtle, nuanced approach. Um, and in terms of responsibility, you know, I, I sort of mentioned in the talk that that's a that's a tricky um, that's a tricky question and so I think because I'm not wanting to run down that moralistic road that leads to censorship and things like that because I think a lot of, of harm has been done going down that path instead I want to educate students to have this kind of cr critical and um, you know set of faculties that they can engage with the subtlety and the nuance to be able to love art and engage with it properly. But I mean, because my other area of interest is moral education, that's the approach I take to moral education as well, is again, I'm not sort of offering a utilitarian or Kantian uh, framework for those kinds of, I guess, meaning making or value judgments. I'm, I'm, my background is virtue ethics. And so it's this much more subtle, contextual, um, responsive reaction, which is why I find it difficult just to give, you know, a sort of one straight answer. And it's about engaging with that particular artwork in a particular time and place. And the impact it can have on a reader will absolutely depend on where they are in their lives at that time and that moment. And it may be completely different to another time and to another person. And that that has to be allowed for as well without losing the fact that I want to have some normative guidelines for 
um, but for making judgments where I can say triumph of the will, um, its value gets diminished because of the unethical value imbued in the artwork itself such that I can't avoid it when looking at the beautiful cinematography and listening to the lovely music, these kinds of things. So I, I think it has to be subtle and nuanced. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think there was uh, quite a few questions around this theme of, of um, recognising the moral complexity, the moral ambiguity um, within, within the tales or within the stories, within the presentations. And what, what strikes me, um, I, I better not ask a question, but what does strike me is that we haven't yet talked about didactic literature per se, or the didactic nature of, of, a, of, of literature, um, and how um, not just the author is involved in, in creating the work of art, but the teacher is involved in using that to meet the student in a particular context and so forth. So I think, as well as thinking about the relationship between the author and the reader, there's, there's that, that, that presentation in between which is the, the didactic act of taking up that story for a particular you know educational purpose anyway so I, i'd be interested to hear about that but we've also got the questions so um uh, maybe they'll they'll be folded in to that uh, can i can i actually um invite katya uh, frimberger next to ask a question please katya uh let me start that video hello um, I w Laura, thank you for your presentation. Um, I wondered if what you thought was the role of um, getting students involved in, you know, practical, for example, filmmaking, um, to give them a se in educating them as critical, compassionate viewers, um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of to get a sense of the collaborative nature of, let's say, filmmaking and the kind of um, ethical and aesthetic decision that are, you know, happening in a, let's say, a filmmaking team. Um, just as an aspect of your, of educating the critical, compassionate viewer, do, do you think there's a role for that or is that a different, a different thing? Um, so I haven't thought about that in particular, but in terms of the, the doing of the art making, the creating artworks, absolutely. Um, I, I think that that's so important. I think that if you're, uh, I'm writing about the necessity of aesthetic education at the moment. So I'm sort of at the start of this of this new book, and I'm going to say that you know all students should be involved in art making of different kinds, and you know whatever gets their interest, their attention, their passion, you know I want to encourage more of that. But I think that it should, yeah, absolutely be combined with these conversations about you know. I don't know if you want to call them theoretical because they, they feel so real to me, you know, they feel so applied, but exactly as you said, it's like, well, who's doing the looking, who's receiving, how, how are we seeing this? How are we picturing the story or the message or what's coming across? And if we were, you know, positioned differently or identified differently, how would we receive that same story or things like that? Uh, you know, which voices are included or excluded? I think that those are such important questions around, you know, the creation of art as well as its reception. So I think if you're involved in actually making it, you know, you start to learn some of that just by doing it, absolutely. But I would absolutely want to have those breakaway sessions where you have the conversations explicitly as well, where you say, okay, let's talk about that. So yeah, absolutely. And if, you know, I don't know if you've already got experience in this or if you're already doing some of this kind of thing, then, uh, you know, that sounds very interesting and I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, there was a question from uh, Grace. I think it was again about the sort of moral ambiguity and the transgressive nature of the the sorts of works of art that we might um, we might uh, enjoy. Uh, Grace, did you want to ask that, or, or do you think that's been answered? Over to you. Um, no, well, I was thinking particularly about education and like, edu educational opportunities. So, if you're an aestheticist, um, you might judge work like Triumph of the Will to be like flawed aesthetically to the extent it's because of its moral flaw that it has. But I was just wondering, Laura, whether you thought that when it comes to moral education, there might be a particular need for those artworks that are at the very edges of ethics or even that transgress those edges. Mm -hmm. So you might deliberately choose de de deficient artworks for your curriculum. I'm just wondering what you 
think about that because you're, you're moving this uh, thinking from aesthetics into education and it raises some extra issues yeah. about whether the educational value is another value on top of everything else for an all considered judgment. Yeah, no, actually, I was just, when, when I was asked that question, I was thinking, I'd like to know what Grace thinks about that, because you've probably thought a little bit more about that than I have. Um, but it almost had that, uh, the thought almost crystallised when that question was asked, and that's why I wanted to sort of the, see what you've kind of, even if it's got quite off the cuff, how, what you think about that, because um, I know it, I'm, it's still quite a new thought to me, actually. Uh, well, in answer to your question about bringing in those flawed sort of examples, I think that's so important. Um, I think that, you know, Triumph of the Will is, again, most of my teaching has been at university level, but I've included it on the curriculum precisely because it is so difficult to engage with. It's so difficult to say, oh, but I can see both sides and it, it highlights the tension, it highlights the debate for me really well. And I think that from what I'm hearing from the other examples, I'll have to read the chat later, but from the kind of, um, the flawed moral heroes or the protagonists that are so popular at the moment, most of them um, are kind of unlikable characters. They're unsympathetic characters. And I think that there's something really important about, you know, us engaging with people that aren't perfect because humans aren't perfect and because, you know, there are real people out there that have all kinds of flaws and we still need to sort of try and understand their point of view or be charitable or sympathetic to them. And, and so I think that, you know, there is a reason why we are depicting these kinds of stories over and over again um, throughout television series and, and these kinds of things. Um, so I think that absolutely we should, you know, the most important thing to do is to have the conversations around and bring that conversation into the classroom. If there's shows that, you know, students are already watching, absolutely have the conversations and, you know, use the community of inquiry so that the students' voices are prioritised because, they're having these conversations already on social media with their friends out in the playground. And there is a absolute benefit to protecting the safe conversation in the educational space with teachers guiding it or helping um, to think through what might be some really tricky issues and, and questions. So in terms of moral education, I think that, you know, these more complex, subtle artworks are, you know, the perfect stimulus that, you know, particularly ones that are already popular. Um, and, you know, I think that that's where, you know, something simplistic where the moral message is just really obvious is uninteresting because it's not inviting us to think through something that's tricky, which is what we do in the real world. It's just saying, well, you know, this is right and this is wrong. And that's uninteresting. We're much more interested in when people get it wrong or how they get to thinking something's right or wrong or why people disagree. So, yeah, absolutely, I think that you know, use the, use the flawed stories and, but we then as educators need to be very, you know, well, well skilled and prepared to deal with the conversation that comes out of that as well. And that might involve knowing our own students quite well, these kinds of things so that we know how to safeguard and, and all of those kinds of things as well and making sure it's age appropriate. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can't help. I can't resist uh, uh, asking a little bit about about all of this because um, it, it so hinges upon a rather grown up uh, relationship to works of art. And I'm I'm all, all the time thinking about you know the the, the little little ones and yeah. how we how we engage little ones in in um, in sort of questions of ethical and moral and the good life um, and there's a kind of reductionism going on but but maybe an appropriate moral reductionism maybe there's space for a kind of um, moral reductionism um, uh, is, it, is it a question of, of age appropriateness? I think that finding age appropriate um, artworks is important um, but having said that you know it, it I guess it you know it depends on on the the art as well so I did do a um, session a few years back uh, where we took primary school children to the art gallery in Western Australia and we had communities of inquiry surrounding a particular artwork and because of the community of inquiry style approach to pedagogy it was very much just what they were coming up with, their interpretations, that, that wasn't informed by the fact that they'd studied art or knew what the painting was about. We chose artworks that weren't that 
famous um, and this kind of thing. And so then it was about, you know, facilitating the conversation that they were leading and, you know, it was based on what they were interested in. Um, but in that case, we hadn't particularly chosen artworks that had moral things or moral messages in them. And so I think the benefit of if you pre-select the artwork that you're going to engage with, you know, with your class, you know what's in it, you know what might come up, um, you know, you could organise concept games or play with the story in other ways. Um, I did another session with um, Aesop's Fables with, um, again, young kids. And I had even five-year-olds in a group where we got them uh, to then act out the story and then change the story. So they were to change the kind of moral of the story. And it was interesting to see the ways that, well, what changed? Was it, you know, the ending? Was it the character? Was it what they thought was important? And we got them to sort of explore that and ask questions that came out of that. And so even something that was quite rigid and fixed as an art form, which was Aesop's Fables, they were able to be quite imaginative with it. So I think that, again, you know, you, you do want to be sort of have a well-structured class um, space, but if you have space for that creative play, kids can be quite imaginative with it and, and take it in unexpected ways that you, I think as long as you know, you sort of unpack and have the dialogue and, and their questions that come out of it at the other end. Um, that's a, it's a good way of, of using of the stimulus. Thank you. Um, there's a couple more questions still. Um, maybe I can uh, ask if Dan McRae wants to, uh, he had a couple of points, one to do with, uh, well, I can't remember, I can't find it now, here we are. Um, that, um, Dan, did you want to ask your question? Dan? Am I muting you, Dan? Great, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Super. I, I'm on a, a beach in Dublin right now. Um, so, uh, first of all, thanks very much for the talk. I guess my, my let's get a simple question is, what are the consequences if we fail to get this uh, educative piece correct for learners and for students? Um, and I suppose for society more broadly, when these guys leave the education uh, walls and get out into society, um, it seems kind of prima facie there's two kind of big risks. The first is that we have um, an overly naive uh, generation of people who are um, apt to be duped and coerced uh, by, you know, compelling pieces of art, um, uh, you know, either for, for good or for ill, perhaps. And then a second risk is that we have um, kind of an overly sensorial generation who are very quick to shut down anything that they find offensive or disagreeable or distasteful. Uh, I wonder, are there any other risks uh, or did you have anything more to say about the possible consequences that if we fail to, uh, to educate people how to engage morally and critically with artworks? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I think you're right. There's, there's lots of dangers, right? Um, those are two. Um, I think one of the things we're seeing in, in a way is, oh, now this is just gonna sound terrible, but almost like there's just this appetite for crap. Can I say that? Am I allowed to say that? Like there's an appetite for um, sort of, you know, there's a lot of, you know, low level, you know, worrying um, reality TV, you know, like the kind of gossip magazine, um, easily digested fluff, the, uh, you know, the, this is this is the classic worry that, you know, our sort of our Marxists like Adorno and Benjamin were worried about that, you know, um, you know, uh, we, we sort of, we moralise, but actually we're just relishing um, the chance to watch the lavish playboy lead this crazy lifestyle. Um, and then at the end we go, oh, but we know he's going to come to no good. But actually what we're valuing um, is this kind of superficiality and just, yeah, uh, the, the things that are sort of frivolous and fun. And I don't know how much of a worry that is, right? So I think that there's the art reflects life question going on here. If what society is valuing a lot is going to be these things that are sort of, you know, flippant and, and superficial and frivolous, 
then we're going to see that reflected, you know, in, in all kinds of things, particularly in, in the sort of entertainment forms we consume. And if they're racist and misogynistic, again, that's reflecting how society is. So what we can have a chance to do is have other kind of artworks come in and reflect on that and offer us a different point of view. And so to counter that position, um, we've actually, with the technology, got the opportunity now where there's, there's so much available that we can, uh, you know, enjoy and have entertainment and art and we, we have accessibility. And so there is the chance to, it might even be stumble across these gems that then give us an appetite for something else. And so I think that, you know, in a way it's, you know, part of the you know, consumer dream that there's everything out there available to us. And so what I see then is that, you know, the art educator, you know, can help guide how to enjoy art or to enjoy certain kinds of art. And again, I'm not into censorship. I'm not saying, oh no, so we can't enjoy the fluff. You know, there might be a time and place for that. But as long as we do it with awareness and we're mindful of, you know, what stereotypes we're perpetuating if we enjoy and, you know, purchase those kinds of artworks. So the danger, I think, isn't just this indoctrination or this naivety, isn't just the judgmental, you know, shut everything downside. It's also just not being mindful of our role as consumers in the art spaces, particularly in mass art spaces. And so... One thing I like the idea of is that if we just bring a bit more awareness to those choices, a bit like ethical consumerism, we're making a demand for uh, things that don't just treat the viewer as if they're stupid or don't just appeal to the lowest common denominator, you know, to encourage things that um, invite that subtlety, that nuance and that, you know, love of the aesthetic, but also that critical engagement with, you know, possibility. So I don't know if that actually answers your question, but I think there are lots of yeah worries and dangers out there that we need to try and avoid. Thanks very much. Um, well, uh, we're pretty much at half past. Maybe if anyone's got a very quick one. I, I'm, I'm conscious that a couple of people made lots of comments. Some of them were questions. I'm not didn't necessarily keep up with everything. So Bob, uh, Bob Davies had lots of comments to make. I don't know, Bob, if you want to make a final question or comment or anything like that, uh, but we do have one minute. No, I, I'm quite happy. I think the, the conversation's been very rich and I've had lots of observations made that I'll price. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I guess it just falls for me to thank everybody again for coming along today. Thanks, Laura, so much for a fascinating um, discussion, presentation, which is incredibly stimulating for all of us. Um, and an incredibly uh, engaged um, group. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. It was absolute pleasure. And hopefully I can get a copy of these comments on the side and have more of a think about them. But feel free to email me as well. <laughs> thank you. As always, this will be up on YouTube and uh, podcast downloadable in due course. Thank you, everybody, for coming and see you in, a, in the next one of these, whenever that will be. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.